Welcome to Gutter. This is Will Sanchez. My special guest today is Clark Keel, who runs for the Urban Athletics. I first heard about Clark from a mutual trainer, Mark Heller, at Equinox. Clark considered himself an accidental runner. But despite numerous stress fractures in his legs, he somehow overcame them and has been running his personal best ever since. Moreover, he has been surprising his teammates and delighting himself in his running because he's been placing very high up in his age group. I'm delighted to have Clark Keel at the Gotta Run TV show. We do have a mutual good friend, Mark Keller, who has taught me a lot about running and encouraged um, me to talk to you in the gym. And now here I am with you on your show. Excellent. Excellent. Clark, let's get started by telling us a little bit about your background. For example, where were you born? And something about your childhood and schooling. Sure. I was born in Houston, Texas, and uh, when I was 10, moved to Atlanta, Georgia. And I, um, I'm the youngest of six children, a uh, large family, active in sports, not, um, not track or, or running, however. I was active in football and baseball and basketball and other sports. And I would run for practice with pads on, or we did it in PE, but I was never focused on running until much later in my life. So this is new to me. Running is new. So the running that you did was in high school, college? I only ran for to better athletic performance in other sports. I played rugby in college and graduate school. Rugby, now, that's almost like football, except they don't have helmets. Right, rugby. It's I consider it a com combination between soccer and football, very similar. Um, uh, I went to the University of Notre Dame and I played for, the, for, for Notre Dame and we got to wear a Notre Dame jersey and go play Ohio State and Michigan and other schools. I originally wanted to play football, but I wasn't given the gift of size, speed, or strength for I, that sport. I see. But there's a lot of running in rugby. So. A lot of running, absolutely. So that's a good stamina building. Sure. And what did you major in at University of Notre Dame, you said? Sure, I was a liberal arts major, um, American studies. Um, after Notre Dame, I came to New York and started a career on Wall Street, not knowing much about finance. And after three years here, the stock market crashed in 1987. I was on a trading desk and I thought maybe this business could change dramatically. And so I went to graduate school at, at Northwestern mm -hmm. for business. So mm -hmm. I got a little bit more training in business and I spent time in Evanston and Chicago and then came back to New York in 1992. So what was your athletic endeavors during that time period? I always ran to keep some physical fitness and I would run low mileage and I thought a long run at the time for me was three miles. Okay. And when I came back to New York, I remember running the reservoir and thinking, well, if I run it once or twice, I've really done as much as I could possibly do. I really felt like that was an accomplishment. And I had no idea of the larger running culture uh -huh. that was running all around me at the time in New York. I was blissfully unaware. Okay, this is in your late 20s, early 30s? In my 30s? late 20s, early 30s, okay. exactly. Okay, so what changed that uh, you did discover the running sure. culture? Sure. Um, a friend of mine, is, she's an elite New York runner. Um, her name's Mary Darling. She would see me running in the park, and she said casually many times, why don't you run the marathon? Okay. And I would say a little bit laughingly, sure, Mary, someday. And I never had any intention of it or ever thought that would be realistic. Mm -hmm. That Next year, no, the year that year, I was in the park running during the New York City Marathon, and I stopped and watched. And I'd never really paid attention as a spectator. And I looked at the different people running by, the different body shapes, the different sizes, ages, categories, all above. And I thought, maybe I could do it. And I said to myself at that point, I'm going to run the New York City Marathon next year. Okay. And so I said to Mary, I'd like to try. And she introduced me to 
um, Urban Athletics, and the owner of Urban Athletics, Jerry McCary, who's a well-known New York City runner. Absolutely. Was running his Tuesdays and Thursday practices, and I started. But in 2006, in the spring, I got prepared to run the 2006 New York City Marathon, right. training with Urban Athletics. And as I was training, I really got you know, a pretty standard schedule, and I started where most people start. I want to break four hours. Right. That was the beginning of how I looked at running the marathon. And I was, um, let's say, 42 years old or so. Uh -huh. And uh -huh. I thought, well, let's see where I stand up. And so I started running for with Jerry just as practice in the third group and the slower of the three groups, not slow by any means, but there were a lot of different types of runners already practicing with Urban on a regular basis. Right, right. Now, this was at the Armory. I know they, that's one of the areas they, they do I wasn't practice. running at the Armory at that time. I have since. I've, I've learned a lot of humility at the track. Uh -huh. The track is a very difficult environment for, for running at times. It's not having track experience. When you get on a track to run, you see you learn a lot about yourself and what great speed people have and maintain. And it's a phenomenal experience. But for me, it's always been humbling because I've been surprised at how fast people are in that environment. Especially at the Armory. The Armory is a phenomenal place to it's run. Not, uh, it's, it's, their track is considered one of the fastest in the world. It's really a great environment and it's amped up at different times. There's music playing and there's a real livelihood to it that is is terrific I, i've enjoyed the track so so you made it to the starting line of the 2006 2006 new york city marathon uninjured uninjured and um, how did it go um i ran 349 oh was, you did it i was really happy and i thought most likely i was one and done i i, I had a great experience um, it went according to the, my plan at the time. And thanks to Urban thanks Athletics. Thanks to Urban Athletics. They, they knew what they had and they delivered. And, and I give them a lot of credit. But then something happened that, because Mark was telling me, you had all these stress effects. Not one, but two and three. Not yeah. one leg, but both legs. So, so tell us what well, happened. First, what is a stress fracture and how did you get this? Sure. There are multiple grades of stress fractures, and it's the beginning of a broken bone. And they start um, by what they call today a stress reaction, which is some kind of bruising inflammation in the bone marrow. And those are low-grade stress fractures. They, they can grade them one, two. When they crack in the bone is when they start seeing them at a grade three or four um, to a broken bone, actually. And so um, I took a little time off from running, not a lot, but I got back into it around 2008 and nine, and I started running with Urban Athletics um, with the goal this time of running the New York City Half Marathon in March um, of 2009. And I had not a great time goal, but I was just getting back into running with Urban Athletics through the winter, and I ran that half marathon and after that race i walked into the store jerry looked at his watch and looked at me he said what are you doing here because i was there a little <laughs> early for his consideration he didn't expect it so i gave him a little bit of a head scratching successful time of 139 which wow, i was this is after you get recovered around those stress fractures. Well, I hadn't started them, and this is what led me to the stress fractures. Oh, okay, the stress fractures happened later. At, con, right after this. Oh, okay. And so what happened is I took what was a good time of the New York City half, and this is when I was gonna go then run the 2010 New York City Marathon. From the New York City half in March to the November Marathon, I took the volume I'd built all of the training for the half and continued to climb the ladder to uh, November with no breaks. You forgot the 10% rule. I, I forgot every rule. <laughs> <laughs> and I overran everything. Uh, well, 
that sometimes happens. Sometimes runners get the Superman syndrome. Correct. And, and you it were was doing setting so well. in. You right. were feeling so good. I was good. feeling good, and I, had, I didn't have the experience base from which to be a fair filter for what I was doing. So as, as we were approaching the end of the summer, um, I was practicing with Urban. It was a Tuesday night, and I remember pulling out of the practice early, limping, and I was walking back, and Jerry was like, you're even limping walking. And he was really, it, he was in shock. He couldn't believe it. So he's like, you should see a doctor. Now, bef you know, a month leading into this, I was already in pain. Mm -hmm. And I became what I thought was a great internet doctor. And what? Internet doctor? Internet doctor. I was reading about my pain and diagnosing myself yeah. with anything other than a stress fracture. I didn't know what one was, yeah, more yeah. or less. Okay. But I thought I had a calf problem. That was my first pain solution. I had PT for my calf. The pain did not go away. Yeah. Then I thought I had a knee problem. The pain didn't go away. My wife said, why don't you see an orthopedic doctor? And I thought she was being extreme. Um, <laughs> so um, the last doctor I saw in August was an orthopedic doctor. I went and had an MRI, and I had a grade four stress fracture, which is a very serious late stage stress fracture in my upper tibia. So not in a normal spot, uh -huh. right below the knee, high for the tibia. Uh -huh. And it was almost a clean break. Wow. So I was in a walking boot and crutches for three months. And so from there, I immediately took, you know, in a walking boot, you're limited. So I did whatever I could do. When immediately when that was the three months in one day, I came right back to running. And another three months into running, I had a stress reaction of my left femur, same leg. Um, but this was a stress reaction, so it was a little early, but I knew the pain. I knew I was feeling pain deep in my thigh. Mm -hmm. That's a shorter recovery because you get it earlier, mm -hmm. about a month. I immediately started running again. Um, another few months later, I had a, another stress reaction in the right femur. And then six months later, I took a month off, started running again. I was running races, train, you know, Fifth Avenue Mile, and starting to improve in areas, ex, you know, exp, exp, expanding my running mm -hmm. knowledge and ability. But um, I had another stress fracture in my foot and a metatarsal, and so stress fracture number, number four. four within an eighteen-month period. Most people would have given up running. Well, they yeah. They, what what kept you well persistent? There's nothing. Um, I haven't found anything like it as far as um, taking what I believe is, I believe I was interesting athletically and had a lot of fun in a lot of sports, but a, when running gave me the chance to feel somewhat competitive in at, at a later point in my life or midpoint in my life and I was having fun competing and running for a team. Mm -hmm, I mm -hmm. felt loyalty to urban athletics uh -huh, uh -huh. and I liked putting on a jersey and running for somebody and I like all of these things that I didn't know when I started running in New York were really going on. Okay. I would see the jerseys and thought, well, that's nice that they're running for Reservoir Dogs or Warren Street or Central Park Track Club, but I just thought it was an affiliation. I didn't realize the teams were competing. Mm -hmm. I didn't, I had no real institutional knowledge of the running culture. Okay. And I was running in the back corrals at the time. Okay, well, it's a learning process. Right. The key learning um, for the stress fractures um, was days off. That was um, one of the biggest. So I went through a fairly extensive study, a metabolic analysis, because the number of stress fractures, the amount of time, given the fact that I'm a male of, you know, in the 50 age bracket, it's what happens to people that have osteoporosis, mainly women, at a later stage mm -hmm, in their lives. Mm -hmm. So I was a complete anomaly mm -hmm. in the medical field, and I saw people at, finally I went to a rheumatologist, 
I went to different orthopedic people and nobody really had much to say about that other than don't run, get a bike, try swimming. <laughs> and I didn't like those answers. So I kept finding new doctors uh -huh. until I found people that said that's, you know, we have to come, we have to look at what's causing them, but it doesn't mean you're not going to ever run again. And right. so um, I found a rheumatologist that, you know, is a bone specialist. They deal with bone disease. And he went through a full complement of work. And ultimately what they said, which is common in most people today, is you're deficient in vitamin D and calcium. Hmm. And so I supplement that. But other than that, there was no outright cause for what happened. So I have to then sort of look back and say, well, what was I doing? And when I look at a running plan, I was running too many days in a row. Uh -huh. And I didn't understand that bones, like every other organ, are living and growing. I thought they were sort of a stable... Oh, no, they're a living stable, creatures. Correct. <laughs> living cells. And so I didn't give them their credit to heal. Oh. And so I was constantly stressing them and not giving oh. them a chance to heal. Well, it sounds like you missed one too many because they're always having clinics about injury-free. Correct. Sounds like you I, didn't go to them. <laughs> well, as I've said, I didn't come from the running background. And so I entered all of this oh, without much It sounds like you didn't knowledge. have a running buddy I didn't either. either. I did not. Oh. And I all, after all of this is when I met Mark. Oh, okay. So Mark, our running, our mutual uh, friend, open up your eyes. He did. He's he's helped me in a lot of ways. Yeah, taking a day of rest is very important. To yeah, let the body. And heal. then not doing too much speed work near each other. And if I'm racing, I don't. There are things I do and don't do. And and one, I mean, I joke about this. I used to think it was good to win practice. <laughs> and, or at least try to win. Well, you're overly competitive but, there. Well, <laughs> practice is supposed to be fun. We're correct. Practice is supposed to be fun. Right. You know, you. you yeah. <laughs> well, and I wasn't practice. good enough to win practice anyway. <laughs> uh, but uh, that's part of the fun of running. It's just you're competing with yourself. But I used to run. I used to overdo a lot of oh, the things okay. where that don't that didn't need that output. Oh, and I, okay. Well, it sounds like you, you consider yourself a bit of a loner back then? I, I was. I went on long runs alone. I trained primarily uh, alone. I, the only group running I did was... What happened was, to Mary Darling? Yeah, she, well, she, she, <laughs> she, uh, she was too fast for me. <laughs> <laughs> so, but um, the only group running I did at the time was with Urban Athletics yeah, on yeah. The, the Tuesday and Thursday time slots or the racing the that racing. I was starting to put in. Oh, okay. You just showed up and... Uh, yeah, you know, um, I come from a different background in running. I was very much into the camaraderie, into mm, the group. Right. And so I was part of the herd. Right. And they trained me and sure. taught me, and that's what I learned. Well, the, if you're by yourself. It's interesting, not being a runner and coming at it from a back corral, I didn't, yeah, I missed the culture that was inherent in the New York running community, New York Roadrunners and larger. And so I missed a lot of that and, until the last few years when I've really found it. Okay. And it's phenomenal. I okay. love it. Absolutely. Well, you obviously you loved it regardless. <laughs> you love it even more. <laughs> I love it even more. It's given me a lot. It's, it's shown me another wonderful benefit oh, of it okay. because it's now, become a main part of my life. Okay. I think in 2013 and 2014, you PR'd in every race you've done, a mile. From the 800 to the marathon. To the marathon. You PR'd right. in the last two years. Yeah, at every distance I've run. Okay. So what's the big difference now? The big difference now, uh, as you said, one is I practice smarter. Um, my plans are more defined in the sense that I, ha I set many goals. If it's a 5K upcoming, like the the, what was known as Coogan's or the Washington Heights 5K that's a month from now is some a race I would like to run well in for my shape. I'm not quite going to be, you know, in fighting shape, but I should be okay. Okay. And so I set many goals towards a, a little bit longer one, like this. the next one would be the Brooklyn Half Marathon in May. Uh -huh. And so with a target in mind, 
I'm able to, with Jerry's help still, he's still coaching me, and I'm still running with Urban. Well, you got the set. shirt on. I got the shirt on. The racing team. And, and uh, we're still, uh, Adidas is still with us. But um, with, with Jerry's help, who's a very smart runner, and we're the same age, and he's been able to help me focus on many goals towards major goals being, you know, is it a longer race? It's so two years ago, um, I focus solely on shorter races. And with some of the goals, two years ago, one of the goals was to break 20 minutes in a 5K. It took a long time. It took five races for me to do that. But so I spent the whole year working on speed. And then the end of the year, which is a race I love, was for me it was the Fifth Avenue Mile, or the, some, a big race at the end of the year. Oh, it is. And I spent a lot of time working on that race for a few years. And, you know, that's when I was doing the track work at Icon. And there's a group that works at the track, the track at Prospect Park. Um, and I was going to specifically work on the shorter races. Um, but this year I ended up running the marathon uh, in 2014 that just passed. And yeah. Well, how did you do on the, uh, the mile race? My best was a. I didn't run it last year in 2014. In 2013, I ran a 5:30. 5:30. Right. I think I was. Good. I was. I couldn't and that was at age 50. It. At age 51. Best. 5:30 at any age is good. A 51 is no, very 50, good. No, 50. Correct. You're right. But for me, what's funny that year is a lot of the race goals I had. I hit the number on the head. Uh -huh. I, I was 5:30. There was no like 5:30 on the nose. Like the 1959 is another example yeah, of where yeah. I was really, I was on the number. I ran a 34-minute five-mile race yeah. on the number. On the number. And I, so it was funny. So are you running with a watch timing yourself, or are you using your body to gauge yourself? Well, that's a good question. Jerry always coaches running by feel. Um, he's old school. He's yep. old school, which I appreciate, and, and I do. I, I have the Garmin on. I don't overly rely on it during a race. Um, a few, I've had a, it's been interesting. This last year in the Brooklyn half, I had a specific goal in mind. I paid a lot of attention to my Garmin. The Garmin and the race clock are not synced. And so I probably wasn't focused on the right guide. Uh -huh. Not that it, caused much of a problem. I was very happy with my time, but you can't rely too much on the watch. The watches, in my opinion, they're terrific to have. It's great information, but I think running by how you feel is more important. Yeah, yeah, I can, I can see that. Um, I, I go by feel myself. Yeah. I think the watches are great during practice. Yeah. You know, to keep a little history or keep track mm -hmm. of uh, how you view improvements. Right. But doing a race... Um, you no, know, maybe it's a feedback kind of thing. You know, sure. Go, you know, go to how you, you can't feel. rely on it. And have a plan. You right, know? right. You're going to go off. Well, the plan is usually go off slow. Right. And at the end, if you feel like it, yeah, go I've for had it. to learn the go off slow plan hard. It's taken a few. I've, I've, I've had the tough experiences doing that the opposite way. Uh, all right. Well, well, it's good to know you're learning from your mistakes. Right. You know, one definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over Correct. again and expecting different right. results. You were doing the thing over and over again, getting hurt, but said, wait a minute. And it's interesting that you went to this long path of finding a doctor because the mantra is always find a doctor that believes that you can't go back into running. Right. And luckily, New York is blessed with New York, many we're of very lucky. You're... Obviously, an urban athletic fanboy. Right, right. <laughs> and you mentioned a few challenges. Got Kukins coming up. What are some of your longer-term goals? Well, I, I've qualified for the Boston Marathon this year and the New York Marathon, which for me is almost hard to say. It is. It's so hard for me to What was your time in New York? I ran 318 this year in the New York City Marathon. That is phenomenal. Which I'm thrilled by. And it was a tough day, as you remember. <laughs> This year? This oh, year. Yeah, it was cold. Yeah, it was cold and windy. Uh, oh, my God. So now is that BQ10? Because it sounds like you way below. I'm the... what, in my age group, it's the 330. It's a year out, so that's one. And I'll decide if I want to run New York 
um, in the fall, I may, likely to do that again. This would be your first Boston? It would be my first Boston. Well, that, is, that is very special. Yeah. So, so I, I hopefully you will train smart for it. Train smart, but it's meeting people like you and others that we're lucky to have in the New York running community that I can learn a lot from because um, I need to keep learning. Yes, we all do. We all keep learning from each other. Right. Clark, on that note, thank you so much for coming in and sharing these stories. Thank I you, Will. You, I really enjoyed it. I wish you continued success. Thank, and same to you. Thank you. I was surprised Jerry didn't send you to Dr. Hamner. Well, I, I went to Dan, Dan I, and I, I, I forgot to mention that, but I went to Dan, Dan. The first doctor, when I was training for the six marathon that Jerry sent me to was Dr. D. And I got to know Dr. D at that point. And in his wonderful, he, he helped me along the way a few points of stress in my legs and got into 2006. But later, he, when he moved offices, remember he was on the Upper East Side, and when he went what, down- Lemon Street. Yeah, when he moved downtown, Denver. I sort of lost track uh, of him at that point. I didn't want to mention it. I said, oh, I know, wait a minute. I know, the, I know uh, Jerry sends his people yeah. to Dr. And Hamner. then he sends them some, a lot to Duke Chiropractic if he thinks it's... Um, yeah, yeah. But Dr. Dan, he... Uh, he, retired. he retired. Yeah. It's been a wonderful life so far, and uh, uh, I feel that way. I mean, I've never thought a lot about the past, but I can't wait to see what's going to happen tomorrow.